everybody. Can you hear me? Good. Um, come closer if you want to, or bunch up a bit if you need to get a bit closer. Um, I'm here to, uh, to talk about the SE-5A, this airplane behind me. Um, 108 years ago, there was a bit of a massive war going on in Europe. Nothing changes, does it, really? Um, and there was a desperate struggle on both sides to, to win and to have the best equipment. Um, at the beginning of the war, our aviation equipment was pretty bad. And it got slight, well, it got significantly better over the course of the war. And this aeroplane probably represents the best British fighter of World War I. Now this particular aeroplane, F904, uh, on the 10th of November 1918, for those of you that buy poppies, you'll realize that that was one day before the war ended. Uh, this airplane was being flown by a major Pickthorn of 84 Squadron, and he shot down a Fokker D7, which was the German equivalent fighter. So this is probably the only combat veteran of World War I that survives. Now, the aeroplane itself, <coughs> it's a biplane, um, they were biplanes not because they needed more lift or because they thought it looked pretty, they were biplanes to make them strong. So the, basically the bottom wing and the top wing are like the flanges of an I-beam girder and the bracing wires between are like the web of an I-beam girder. It makes it very strong and stiff for the weight. That's why you have biflanes. <coughs> and uh, this one was made even stronger with extra bracing. So you've got the normal um, cross wires here and then you've got this extra one here that attaches uh, sort of mid-span to make it even stronger and stiffer so you could fly really fast. These were known to have dived to about 200 miles an hour uh, during the war. <coughs> Just to put that in perspective, we probably won't fly this above 150 now. Um, <coughs> other things, the engine is a really easy engine to use. It's a V8 um, and good for 200 horsepower. It's water-cooled, so you can see that bluff front is the radiator, and we're able to adjust the radiator by moving these shutters. <coughs> these gadgets here operate like a Venetian blind to open and shut to let more or less air through the radiator. The aeroplane armament is odd. It has one Vickers machine gun mounted on the fuselage, just um, ahead of the pilot's cockpit. And then on the wing, it has a Lewis machine gun mounted on the top wing, which you probably can't see. And it's a strange arrangement. And it, uh, it derived from the fact that when they were building this, they decided to consult the best fighter pilot and ask him, how they ought to arm the aeroplane. And the best fighter pilot at the time was a guy called Albert Ball. And he had all his successes flying a Newport with a Lewis gun on the top wing. And he developed this technique of flying under the enemy aeroplane and shooting up and killing the crew from underneath. So he said, oh, you've got to have a Lewis gun on the top wing. But it was a silly idea. They should have had two Vickers guns like the Saltwith Camel. They just took one guy's opinion. Um, other interesting things about the aeroplane, if you get a chance to walk around it, you'll see it has a good size fin um, compared to other World War I aeroplanes and a uh, reasonable tailplane size. It also has dihedral, the wings sweep upwards as they go up. That makes the aeroplane stable in all axes, so it's stable in pitch um, and roll. And with your feet on the rudder bar, it's stable in your directionally. Now that's 
interesting, it makes the airplane slightly easier to fly, but more importantly, particularly in a warplane, it gives you a chance to come home. So there was a chap that wrote a combat report, his name was um, uh, Napier, Captain Napier was flying one of these and he saw some enemy well below him. He rolled over and dived down at the enemy and in the dive, he said the airplane shook tremendously. Uh, what he had encountered actually was something called flutter, but he wouldn't have known what that was. And he broke off the attack and um, none of the controls worked. The rudder worked, but the stick, nothing on the stick worked. But he was able to fly home just using the rudder and the, and the trimmer. Uh, and you can only do that with a stable aeroplane. If that had been a Sopwith Camel, he would have been toast. So um, the, the design of this was well ahead of its time. It was designed by a guy called Folland, who went on to design the Gladiator and the Folland Nat, which I trained in as a teenager many years later. Um, uh, so there we are. It um, equipped loads of squadrons on the Western Front and was um, <clears throat> a pretty straightforward airplane to fly compared to the rotary engine airplanes like the Sopwith Camel. And you generally had um, uh, two schools of thought, the pilots that flew Sopwith Camels and the pilots that flew the SE-5, and they didn't really cross-fertilize much um, because it was a very different technique. But this was arguably the spitfire of the first war in that it was fast and stable. And the Sopwith Camel was the hurricane of the first war in that it was lashed together, uh, horrible to fly, but there were loads of them and they did a lot of good. Um, so this is your... Um, World War I Spitfire. It's a cracking aeroplane. Um, if you've flown aeroplanes, if you've ever flown a Tiger Moth, it's quite similar, except it climbs a lot better because it's got 200 horsepower in the same weight. And that's about it. I think I'm, I'm talked out now, so if you have any questions, um, I'll try and answer them. But I'm a bit deaf, so you'll have to shout. Why were the guns angled up so high, guys? <coughs> Relative to the... Uh... Okay, the question is why were the ang uh, guns angled up? Well, the, really the reason for that is that you never actually fire at an enemy straight behind him. He doesn't let you do that if he's got any sense. He's normally turning, trying to avoid you. And when you're turning, he's always just ahead of you. So that, you know, arguably, the more the guns are aimed up a bit, the, the less lead you need when you're trying to shoot him down in a turn. How long is that in the air? What's the flight time? <clears throat> um, to dry tanks, about two and a half hours. Um, that flight where Captain Pickthorn shot down the D7 was a two hour flight. Uh, it was probably typical of the period.